Hello everyone, welcome to this hybrid book launch of Ruth A. Ragsdale, Washington at the Plough, The Founding Farmer and the Question of Slavery. Uh, I'm sure many of you will have read the book already, but Bruce is very kindly going to be signing some copies here today for those of you here in the house. And if anyone joining remotely would like to get their hands on a signed copy, then please just email info at benjaminfranklinhouse.org and we can sort that out for you. We are so delighted to welcome Bruce to Benjamin Franklin House today um, to discuss this, this recent study of Washington. Bruce served for 20 years um, as director of the Federal Judicial History Center office um, at the Federal Judicial Center. <laughs> uh, he's the author of A Planter's Republic, The Search for Economic Independence in Revolution Virginia. And he's been a fellow at the Washington Library in Mount Vernon and also the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you. Very glad to be here. <laughs> we're so glad to have you. Um, and in terms of the format for this evening, we're going to start with a conversation. I'm going to ask Bruce some questions, and then we'll be opening up the conversation to questions from both the in person and virtual floor. So, um, just to get started, Bruce, we're interested in, in hearing a bit about how you came to write about this subject. I have been studying Washington for a long time. He um, was a major character in the first book I wrote, and I have for many years thought that this is the most important untold story about what is otherwise the most familiar of the founders, and that um, we really needed to have a, a story of Washington's entire life as a farmer if we were going to fully understand Washington. And I think he would have agreed with that too. A British visitor to Mount Vernon just after the um, Revolutionary War said that Washington's greatest pride following the Revolutionary War was to be considered the first farmer of America. This is in 1785. And I wanted to find out why, why would Washington have considered this accolade so important after he had just won the war for independence and was working to establish a new nation? Why, why would this um, public recognition of his interest in agriculture be so important to him? So I wanted to figure out why was this part of his leadership? What was he trying to accomplish at Mount Vernon? And how did that contribute uh, to the prosperity of, of the new nation? I also um, uh, wanted to explore another side of Washington that I think has been forgotten to, uh, to memory, and that is this notion of Washington at the plow. It, uh, it was a comparison with Cincinnatus at the plow. He was frequently compared to the Roman general Cincinnatus, who had been called from the plow to defend the Republican battle, and then when offered arbitrary power after, uh, after his military victory, refused it and returned to the plow. In the 18th century, this um, image of Cincinnati at the plow is really considered a paragon of public virtue. And so people compared Washington to Cincinnati. They present him with a plow, most famously in the Udon sand standing sculpture. And I, I, I wanted to recover that image that made his farming so much more famous and made it, it so much more politically important. And, that image of Washington at the plow is part of what attracted so much attention to his agricultural innovations, both in America and in Europe, and especially in Great Britain. And um, that, that notion of Washington at the plow, sort of the idea of, of the farmer dedicated to the public good, um, is, is something that also set a standard of expectations for what Washington was doing as a farmer. And I think it, it, Frank, he was always aware of that. He was always concerned about his reputation. I think it also um, established a standard of expectations that um, had a great influence on his reevaluation of slavery and his ultimate decision to emancipate the enslaved that he controlled. And, and that finally is the other part of the, the book that I thought was going to be most important was because the story of Washington, the farmer, is the story of Washington, the enslaver, and he's involved, relying almost entirely on enslaved agricultural labor his whole life. And then it's only through his life as a farmer that you can trace the changes in his attitude towards slavery and what is ultimately a, a new reckoning with slavery after the Revolutionary War. And when it is through farming that he finally confronts that paradox of slavery and freedom. He spoke very little about his emancipation. He wrote almost nothing about it. Um, and that it's only through uh, the story of him as a farmer that you can trace his slow progress toward his decision to emancipate the enslaved. 
Well, you've just outlined all the really fascinating threads that run through the book that hopefully we'll get to unpick a bit this evening. Um, but my, my second question was more about your, your process, so kind of the, um, having decided on the idea, um, what were the next steps and, and sort of how you, you researched the book and um, if the archives you consulted as well. Yeah, I, I was incredibly fortunate because there's such a rich documentary base related to Washington and farming. Um, so, so rich that it made me even <clears throat> more surprised that there hadn't been an earlier book on this written because um, there's an enormous amount of correspondence and his diaries, which his diaries in many ways, they're not traditional diaries. They're not a recount of his business of the day. Most of the time his diaries are about what's going on at the farm. So they were an enormous resource. But on top of that, Washington was just a, a, a record keeper. He, he had such a penchant for recording everything and keeping close documentary account of accounts and um, reports of work on the um, estate. So that together, that correspondence and those financial and work reports make Mount Vernon probably the most well-documented estate in the 18th century um, Chesapeake. Um, the great challenge was merging those two. And it was, I started with the very familiar sources that are um, his correspondence, which are online and very easily accessible. Um, a lot harder was going through the financial accounts and through the many, many uh, records of the estate and, <clears throat> and trying to merge those two into a, a narrative. And those, those records of the financial records and the records of the estate are so important because it's really there that you can trace the lives of individual enslaved people and you can trace um, his management of enslaved labor much more so than in the correspondence. The surprising thing is that once I pulled those together, I, I found a, a clear narrative of his life as a farmer, that there were themes as his life as a farmer that were um, came through that um, made it easier to present this as um, a chronological narrative. And, and lastly, the source that I hadn't anticipated using and used quite a bit was I spent a lot of time reading the 18th century, almost entirely British agricultural treatises that Washington read. And um, they just provided a different insight into what he was trying to do in Virginia. I see what, what interested him. And, um, and how he processed that material. You get a sense of his intellectual life and his reading habits in a way that you, um, that's not easily discerned anywhere else in his life. That was really fascinating, this kind of triangulation between the different source documents. It does sound like it was a bit of detective work, particularly with the accounts and kind of deciphering and making, making yeah, An awful lot of the information in the accounts, and particularly about the enslaved, is so. Um, it's so spread out and so sporadic, and, and it's not, you, you, it takes a very long time to process all that. And um, every time I go back, I've never worked on a project where it was so important to go back to the primary sources again and again, particularly those accounts and the work reports. And, and you'd find information in places you would never imagine, like in the accounts of the shoemaker. <laughs> <laughs> the shoemaker at Mount Vernon, you actually can then identify a lot of the special positions that some of the enslaved laborers had, had assumed, and it's only because they're noted in something as, as seemingly arcane as, as the um, shoemaker's account. Absolutely. We've um, spoken with uh, other authors who've, who've uh, visited us about just the difficulty of the, sort of the lack of records and so having to really dig deep to, to find those stories and mm -hmm. piece them together. Um, and so, so important. Um, and then you, you touched on this and the, um, the, the, the status of Washington at the plow as a figure and as, a, as an image, but you also allude to the fact there hasn't been another full uh, book length study of Washington the farmer. I just wondered if you had some theories as to, as to why that was, if it had less um, focus. Um, it, it is in many ways surprising because his farming life is is related to much larger topics, both in terms of his sort of commercial vision for the new nation and especially for his attitude and, um, toward slavery. But I think his role in the, as a military commander and as um, in public service, particularly as president, is just so fundamental to the establishment of the United States that it really, in some ways, blots out everything else when biographers turn to him. That this might, one of the um, uh, reviewers of the manuscript for, for the press um, wrote that 
he was struck that we've spent 200 years talking about what was most important about Washington for us and have overlooked what he found most important and most enjoyable and interesting. And so I, I think his, part of it was, as I mentioned, his, his farming life takes on this symbolic importance and it's, um, photographers often talk about that without talking about the actual practical um, uh, interest in, in farming. Um, but it also is kind of dismissed as, as almost a rural amusement, as almost something that just he found enjoyable and entertaining when he wasn't a general and a president. Whereas, in fact, when he's a general and a president, he's paying attention to farming all the time, particularly as president. It's quite remarkable how much time he spends. Um, basically, one day a week, he devotes to going through the reports he's getting from Mount Vernon and detailed instructions. So farming is never very far from, from his mind. And um, I, I think um, in the, I, I'm frequently asked how he um, compares to Thomas Jefferson as a farmer. And I think in, uh, from the 20th century into our own century, most people think of Thomas Jefferson as the leading founding farmer or farmer among the founders. And um, uh, that really, that reputation only comes about in the 20th century. And um, in part during the New Deal, Jefferson is closely associated with um, the young and farmer who is seen as the foundation of American democracy. Um, whereas, in fact, Washington was at the, at the time of the 18th century seen as the preeminent farmer among the founders. And the person who believed that above all others was Thomas Jefferson. When Jefferson came back from France. Um, he decides he wants to implement the same kind of agricultural innovations and kind of crop rotations um, that um, Washington had introduced. And he wants to do it in Monticello. And the first person he turns to is Washington. Um, he meets with Washington in Philadelphia. They go out to visit farms in the surrounding area. Uh, Jefferson um, stops at Mount Vernon on one of his trips back and forth to, to Philadelphia. And Washington takes him out into the field, shows him how he's organizing the crop rotations. And um, so one of the things I, I wanted to do was just to restore Washington as the new founding farmer. Absolutely. And um, you sort of started to touch on this, but what was the significance of um, Washington's role as a farmer amongst his contemporaries, so, so Jefferson, other, other Americans, but also internationally um, in Britain and elsewhere in Europe? Yeah, um, in, in many ways, Washington is the most celebrated farmer, at least within the English-speaking world, and in much of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and and it is, um, farming was very closely watched. This is particularly after the Revolutionary War. Um, and um, he, he has an audience for, for what he's doing. And very, very much um, from the time of the Revolutionary War on, um, he's farming on a public stage. And um, this, um, this is both in the United States, where there's a, a new generation of agricultural societies that are established, and they all induct Washington as their first honorary member. Um, but it also is particularly in Great Britain, where there's very close attention. And um, when they, um, people, agricultural leaders in Great Britain find out that Washington is um, interested in farming and that he wants to adopt British farming um, techniques more, even more thoroughly than he had earlier, um, there's enormous support in comments. So this attention brings a lot of practical support. Um, somebody like Arthur Young, who's one of the leading agriculturalists of, of the time, um, he writes a letter to Washington and said, I'm here to supply you with plows, with seeds, with advice, with books. And he does all of that. And um, Washington is the beneficiary of a, of a, a network of really an almost global network that is, can be traced through the British Empire of the exchange of plant material and uh, breeding stock he receives from the West Indies. Um, but he, he receives plant material literally from all over the world. He's, he's got wheat from the Cape Colony in Southern Africa, and or cotton from China. Um, uh, James Anderson, one of the great Enlightenment figures in Edinburgh, is the person who supplies him with everything from the first Swedes or rutabagas that are ever grown in the United States come through Anderson, but he also sends him um, crops that have been brought back to um, Great Britain from, from India. And um, it, it connects Washington with a, a circle of improvement really all over, over the English speaking world.
there's a fascinating that link between um, Washington's farmer and the Enlightenment world and those international connections. I'm sure it's another thing that people maybe have overlooked um, uh, previously. Um, so it's no, I, I, I think looking at it in terms of farmer, um, you have a much stronger sense, um, I mean, every part of his, his public life as well, how, how um, connected he is with especially the wider Atlantic world and how much she expected the United States to be engaged with Europe, much more so than people in the early 19th century would have been thinking. Um, but he still has this framework that it's a worldview that um, was, was formed as part of, as when he was a part of the revolution. And obviously he rejected much of that, but he also believes that there are these natural interests, reciprocal interests that can be served um, when people work across national lines on things like agricultural and scientific exchanges. And then, so as well as how um, important Washington's role as a farmer was to his contemporaries, I wanted to speak a bit more to how important it was to him personally and how central he saw it to um, America's future. It, 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 it's really important on both of those levels. I don't think you can understand him personally without understanding him as a farmer, and it shows you a, a personal side that's not normally appreciated or associated with, um, with Washington. For one thing, there's this enormous intellectual curiosity and a commitment to experiment. It's really as a farmer that you see Washington as a figure of the Enlightenment. And that, um, that he is so interested in that from a pretty early stage, even before he's in correspondence with people in Great Britain. He's reading um, most of his knowledge about farming, uh, the new techniques of farming and British farming, initially comes through books, not through um, any communication with other, other individuals. But you also see, see a personal side of him that I think is an otherwise visible. He has a very um, strong connection with nature. He has an almost intuitive ability to read a landscape. Um, he can drive through a forested area and um, tell what crops will and won't grow there, or he thinks he can get there, but the kinds of trees and kind of soil he sees. And he's always thinking about agricultural potential. But then also the farming is it, 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 so important on a much broader vision of, of how he sees the role of the United States. And, and his, his, Innovations as a farmer are always connected to his anticipations of what would be the political economy of the United States. This even dates back into late colonial Virginia. He sees that the empire is not serving Virginia the way it used to. The kind of restrictions on the, on the navigation acts had once protected tobacco growers and encouraged tobacco um, trade. That's no longer true by the 1760s. And he sees that. There's a need to develop other crops that can be traded outside the bounds and the confines of, of empire. That's one of the great appeals of, of wheat. And then after the, the Revolutionary War, he's convinced that um, it, it's agriculture that would guarantee a commercial prosperity in the United States. And also, he thinks that a shared culture of wheat farming and the commerce associated with that will unite the country, especially as. White settlers are moving it uh, beyond the mountains into the West. He, he, he thinks that ties of culture and language and politics will have no hold if there's not also a commercial bond. And he sees the likeliest source of that commercial bond through um, grain farming and trees. So the farming that he's engaged in on a very minute level that is born, he also is always aware of the larger uh, implications mm -hmm. for the development the nation and its connections with other countries. Absolutely, and then uh, as well as it, its, um, connect, its connection to other countries, I wondered a bit close to home how Washington saw farming kind of influencing ongoing relations with Native Americans, and especially, as you mentioned, um, white settlers going towards the West. What his view on that was? You'd, you'd think there'd be more connections than there <laughs> are. He, um, he evidently didn't think there was much had to learn or needed to learn from Native Americans. Um, there's, there's a great comment in Colin Calloway's book on the Indian world of George Washington that Washington's always talking about um, these beautiful natural meadows that he's discovering in our country. It's how it that they're not natural at all. They've been cultivated and managed by um, Indian nations for 
centuries, basically. Um, he's aware of, of the farm animal Indians, but he doesn't see it as something to incorporate in his own garden. Um, but then he has a fairly narrow view of what is appropriate anyway, and it's almost all defined by British practice. Um, many Americans had found effective ways to um, grow crops uh, by rotating the soil, and but it left the states looking terrible because we just let land sit for 20 years. He had no interest in that. It is true after when he's president, he and the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, devise um, fairly um, uh, involved uh, uh, um, plans to extend the kind of agriculture he was interested in, and settle grain agriculture, extend that to um, Indian nations. And um, he sees that as a way of assimilating them, or sort of pacifying them, or also tying them commercially. Um, and there's, there's a great deal of emphasis on this. It's interesting, if you look at all the peace medals that the Washington administration offered um, the, the heads of Indian nations, they almost always um, feature an image of an Indian with the kind of plow Washington would have had in his time. Um, but not much comes of this. For one thing, the Indian nations don't really need this kind of army. They have their own very successful work. Uh, agriculture, so it, um, and it doesn't really have any impact on the way he farms. A lot of dialogue, but again, this kind of sim symbolism of um, um, he was a farmer or <laughs> others as farmers is fascinating. Um, and then you mentioned briefly, but it would be great if you might be able to go into more detail on um, Washington's relationship with farming and how that impacted his um, evolving view of, of slavery and. and how is the future of that in America as well? Yeah, farming and enslaved labor are just inseparable in Washington's whole life. Um, from, from the time he was a child growing up, he would have seen his father and later his mother managing the enslaved laborers in the field until the very end of his life. He relies almost entirely on enslaved that labor, cultural labor. Um, and uh, at each stage of his development as a, as a farmer and of the innovations that he introduces, he's at the forefront of efforts to adapt enslaved labor to new kinds of farming. Um, even when he rejects tobacco, he really wants to displace the tobacco economy that had been the foundation and, and the reason, the justification for, or at least the, the um, reason for the introduction of, of slavery in Virginia. He still relies on enslaved labor. He continues to buy new enslaved laborers throughout the 1760s when he abandons tobacco at Mount Vernon and moves toward, entirely toward wheat as his cash crop. Um, he introduces new kinds of um, crafts and um, on the estate and expects the enslaved laborers to, um, to, take, to learn those crafts. So he becomes more and more dependent on it. And, um, I think most surprisingly is that um, there is a change in his attitude towards slavery during the a revolution. He can't avoid seeing what everyone can see, which is when he knows that many, many, many enslaved blacks um, used the disruption of, of the war as, as an opportunity to escape to the British to find um, some kind of permanent freedom. Um, this included people in his own estate who had found refuge um, with a British ship that was anchored off Mount Vernon. And so he's, he's very um, aware of the ways in which enslaved blacks had challenged their bondage during the revolution. And he also is aware of the rise of the new anti slavery movement. Um, um, it's, it's clearly when it's advocated by people who is very close to people who respects it's important to not yet. Um, but, um, even after being aware of those two developments, he changes his management of slave labor in many ways. But he also, when he returns um, to Mount Vernon after the Revolutionary War, he, um, he goes to great lengths. He makes a number of conscious choices to make sure he's even more dependent on slave labor and to make it work with a new, much more complicated and involved um, system of, of, of farming. Um, he does seem to have made a, a conscious effort to change um, his management practices. Um, and, and he tries to mitigate what he assumes are the most rural parts of slavery. He 
one who's always not to sell or buy any more in slave laborers. Um, he insists that his managers provide adequate provisions in medical care. Um, he tries to limit the use of violent um, coercion and punishment of the enslaved. Um, and, and he thinks in some ways, he's not alone in this, but he thinks in some ways he can almost improve slavery, make it, Mark Jefferson sort of it, he wanted to make it more rational and humane, and, and uh, Washington would be more the same. Um, but at the same time, he expects even more labor from them in return. And of course, those efforts fail. They cannot improve inherently so they will be coercive. Um, absolutely. And then um, at, at the end of his IP, he would um, seek to emancipate um, slaves on um, by slave people onto the state. Um, and so just was there was a link between between that, that act and kind of his thoughts on farming and, and the overlap there. I um, I talk at great length in the book, and book um, it's a fairly complicated act, but um, that it's only when he decides that um, slavery and agriculture improvement are incompatible that he moves toward um, uh, actually uh, making good on, on his support for the actual abolition. And uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. He, he comes to, um, to see that, um, that there is an inherent conflict between British um, methods of agricultural improvement and British management of agricultural labor that he wants to, to emulate, and that he, he, he comes to realize that these are just um, incompatible with, with slavery. He also comes to a much stronger recognition that in areas of the United States that are not dependent on the slave labor, even those that are involved in the same kind of agriculture, especially those that are involved in the same kind of agriculture, um, that, that they are far ahead in Virginia or Maryland, which are grain cultures that rely upon its slave labor. I think particularly his time in Pennsylvania you know, while he's president, where he's very, very um, closely observing farming. He rides out in the countryside, he comments at a great length about the farming in Pennsylvania, he uses this as a standard. He, he will write back to his farm manager and say, this is what they're doing with clover here. This, this is you know, the way they're they're plowing now here. And, um, and toward the end of his presidency, he writes to one of his British correspondents. And I think it's telling that he would share this with um, a, a, a British correspondent rather than an American. But that he says that the, the, the improvement of agriculture in Pennsylvania, which is outstripping that of Virginia and Maryland, is not because the land's better or the climate's better or that they have better access to commerce, but it's because they've um, instituted the gradual abolition of slavery in Virginia. Maryland had not, and he says, but it's very clear that they must. And it's really this major um, recognition in his part that he could not um, combine this very ambitious program of, of British husbandry with a reliance on enslaved labor. Well, thank you so much for going into more detail, but absolutely it's something you really need to, to read through and um, more complexity of it, but I think fascinating study. It's something that's been a, a big question for, for a long time. Um, and as we are going to Franklin House, we uh, have been, been here this evening, yeah. we do like to ask if there might be any links with, with Franklin, and of course they, they did know each other well. So I just wondered if you saw any parallels between the intellectual interests of Washington and Franklin, particularly in relation to the, to the themes we've discussed this evening. Um, but we have had parallels and um, inspirations from somebody like Franklin. I mean, the, the <clears throat> direct connection that they have is the American Philosophical Society. Um, Franklin's the founder of it. Washington is in, um, inducted as a member in 1780. Um, Washington, he also then sponsors um, several of his British correspondents as members of the American Philosophical Society, who then become contributing members to the members. Um, but the, the more important point there is that there's this larger sense that, that Franklin really is such an important person in defining these um, networks of exchange of scientific information. And he really sets the pattern and, and makes clear how many benefits there are of having this um, transatlantic and transnational exchange of, of scientific knowledge. And that it is something that can be done without um, there's a very strong belief 
um, in the 18th century, especially beginning with Franklin, that somehow these things are above national jealousies, um, that they can be um, shared in, and benefited from even by um, countries that have enormous um, source of conflict in other, other areas. I mean, the question that um, I would love to know somewhat more about is that Washington certainly knew that Franklin had been a signatory to um, one of the petitions submitted to the first Congress in um, early 1790 asking for an abolition of slavery. It was one of the stronger worded one, several coming into the Congress. Um, Washington was very aware that these are being considered by Congress. He calls it a waste of time, but he certainly um, followed those debates very closely. He was um, very, very worried that this would um, uh, divide the nation, um, that it would separate um, states with um, a greater attachment to it, um, slavery from, from the others. Um, but he never comments on, on the individuals who was, but he certainly would have known. And um, the important point there is that Franklin then becomes one in a long line of people who Washington respected enormously, who also become anti slavery advocates and work conditions. As I said, it begins with Lafayette. But it continues throughout the 1780s that people Washington deeply respects call on him to join the abolitionist cause, to emancipate his own slaves, uh, always arguing that it, it, it's a natural extension of his role as the hero of American liberty and of American freedom, that he should extend that freedom, not, not just to enslaved people that are not learning, but to all of, of Blacks who remain enslaved in, in the United States. And um, this is it's a steady appeal of people throughout um, the years following the Revolutionary War. And Franklin is just one more, obviously, very um, influential um, voice in that regard. Uh, the other intriguing <coughs> connection that I'd like to know more about is that um, Franklin played a very important role in defining what is probably one of our strong, strongest images of Washington. I think the Gilbert Stewart portrait and Houdin's standing sculpture of uh, Washington, which was commissioned for the Virginia State Capitol. Um, there's a copy of it right here, a few blocks away in front of um, the National Gallery on Trafalgar Square. Um, and it's the great image of, of Washington as Cincinnati. Um, the Virginia Assembly wrote to Franklin and Jefferson, who were both in Paris still, and asked them to choose a French sculptor. Uh, Franklin and Jefferson chose Houdon, and they met with Houdon and discussed what, what, how, what, how should Washington be represented, especially Washington and Cincinnati. The great debate was whether or not he um, would appear in ancient dress, as Cincinnati normally would be, or in modern dress. And they decide it should be in modern because this image of him as Cincinnati has a real power and practical effect. Um, Washington, by the way, wrote Jefferson and said, probably not appropriate for me to be <laughs> introducing myself in this discussion, but I, I vote in favor of modern dress. And it was, of course, in modern. And um, what I always like to point out is that that sculpture um, it has all the symbols of, of both military and uh, civil command. It also has him with the plow, but it's not the plow that's normally associated with Cincinnati. It's a drill plow, which um, would have originally been done, designed in Great Britain. Washington designs his own. It's manufactured by the enslaved carpenters and blacksmiths at Mount Vernon. And it, it's, um, it's there with him. And, after Jefferson and Franklin had met with Houdon, they decided he should actually meet Washington, not work from a portrait or a painting. And so Houdon decides to go to Virginia, do a life study of Washington, but he sails on the same ship that Franklin takes back. So they spend six weeks or more at sea, and I, I like to think that at some point during that voyage, they talk more about what would be the proper representation of, of Washington and Cincinnati. So, Great, yeah. Fly on the wall for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've got one, one last question at the moment, please. So we will be coming to all these questions soon. So uh, those of you joining remotely, please do send in your questions either by typing in the chat or in the QA function as well. Um, but the last question I wanted to ask was around kind of what might come next. So um, I wondered if this book had brought up any further research questions which you might be looking to explore in, in future publications. 
Um, well, I've already started on my <laughs> next book, um, which is going to be um, about the, other, the more familiar British farmer George's. Um, I'm writing a book on um, George III's interest in agricultural improvements. I had been very fortunate to be a fellow with the Georgian Papers Program at the Royal Archives several years ago. And I went um, to investigate the parallels, which are enormous. They do the exact same kinds of innovations and experiments at the same time. They're relying on some of the same correspondence. And they certainly, it was there when I was a fellow there that I was able to read a lot of the agricultural treatises. George III had a phenomenal collection. Um, and um, almost everything Washington had was also in George III's collection. Um, it's a somewhat different story because Washington, uh, George III was viciously um, um, satirized in the press as former George. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be looking at that, but I also, um, I, I also found that he really was connecting himself with a cutting edge new designs of, of estate management. And so, um, and he also, like Washington, thought he was doing this, or he thought he was doing this as an example. So um, that'll be the next book on the other, on the George. <laughs> well, that sounds fascinating. And it's interesting to think about how the civil, symbolism ended up in a different place. Yes, yeah, but very different public like response to their um, agricultural interests. Fascinating. Well, um, thank you so much, Bruce. It's just been fascinating thank to hear more, more about the book and, and that discussion. And I wondered if, if anyone wants to ask any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Um, it's actually from friends more after Washington died. So I was wondering um, for how long, if they even did, um, did his stepchildren and their descendants keep Washington's farm methods implemented in Mount Vernon, or when it stopped being a productive farm per se? Almost immediately, it stops being productive. <laughs> um, I think um, it's very sad. Washington, when he decides he wants to um, free the enslaved, it's very important to him to try and figure out a way that he can continue um, his agricultural improvements without reliance on enslaved labor. And that's why he's so insistent on um, he, he wants to turn it over to tenants, but these are very highly capitalized, highly experienced tenants, and he will. He says privately that he will only lease uh, these farms to English or Scottish farmers because he thinks they're the ones who will carry this on. Um, and when he writes his will that provides for the emancipation of the freedom of the enslaved people he controlled, he then divides um, the estate among his various nephews. And I think when he does that, he knows that none of these will continue. Um, he, you know, the center of the um, of the estate is given to his nephew Bushrod Washington, who's already sitting on the Supreme Court. He's not going to be a farmer, and the farming falls apart very quickly. Um, and there's a very poignant um, a description that I, I quote in the book, where somebody visits in the 1830s, so it's not that long after Washington dies, where he talks about the ruins of these grand agricultural buildings that have already started at these brick barns that Washington said were probably the largest and most efficient in the United States and they're already collapsing. Um, his whole, um, his whole um, uh, system of agricultural improvement was hugely expensive. It was something that was really only practical for someone that is means. It was not something that could easily be replicated by small farmers. So unfortunately, Many of those practices related to soil fertility and stewardship of the land um, vanished through most of the 19th century. I don't know if there are any questions coming in. Yeah, I'll just say that virtual There are, we have a few. Um, the first is you mentioned Washington's international status as a farmer of his time. Um, how did he disseminate his uh, agricultural innovations to a world audience? He was very, very reluctant to do that. And it's a strange, it's one of the stranger stories about Washington, not just in Tony. Um, he, he's reluctant to play the role of public advocate. Um, he, he can believe in something very, very deeply and not want to be um, associated with it publicly. He doesn't want to get ahead of the issue. Um, his correspondent, Arthur Young, in Great Britain, who publishes an extremely popular journal called The Annals of Agriculture which published um, contributions by people from, from really all, all over Europe and, and especially Great Britain. It even published articles um, 
written under a pseudonym by George III, um, he again and again asks Washington if it would be possible to um, publish this very sophisticated um, survey of American agriculture that Washington had prepared for him. And Washington says, no, it would be a piece of ostentation and um, we won't let it be done. And, um, there's some context for that also, is Washington never really becomes a public advocate for the Constitution. Everyone knows he was president of the Constitutional Convention. Everyone knows he supports it. He probably believes this is more important than anything in his life after the revolution. And yet he's not someone who would write a pamphlet. He doesn't not give public speeches. He really thinks that his example is sufficient. And in terms of farming, he, he did, and, and it obviously wasn't. It didn't convert people just to it. Um, do you know what happened to any of Washington's emancip emancipated slaves or what kind of life they would have had? There's been um, a fair amount of, of research on that. Um, a number of the um, uh, who have been enslaved by Washington remain in the area. Um, there's a small community that uh, becomes a, a free black community throughout the 19th century called One Spring here. Um, there are several family, uh, descendant families a number of descendant families who were still involved in that number. Um, and so they, they have been traced. The great, one of the great tragedies in that is that um, over half the enslaved people at Mount Vernon were not owned by Washington. They were owned by the Custis estate. During the time of his marriage, he has control over their labor. Um, but on his death, they um, revert to the Custis estate. And so the, um, over the 40 years that um, Washington had been married to Martha Custis, many, many, many of those people had married. And um, so families were disrupted by his emancipation. And it's, um, some, of, some of those people remained enslaved nearby and probably um, maintained ties with their free relatives, but others did not. And this is a related question, actually. Um, you've mentioned Washington's will emancipating the slaves he owned, but the vast majority of Mount Vernon slaves were owned by Martha Washington uh, via her first husband. How much did their slave emancipations contribute to the financial failure of uh, Mount Vernon after George and Martha died? Uh, well, they, those, um, the enslaved that were part of the Custis estate are, are all removed from Mount Vernon. They are divided among uh, Martha's four grandchildren. Um, two in Washington, one uh, nearby in Arlington, another much closer is married to a Washington nephew. Uh, but the enslaved people at Mount Vernon after Washington and Martha's death are those who were brought by, um, brought by the, the nephews who inherited the estate. Um, and one more. Um, who would have been available to work for Washington's farm um, after the slaves were emancipated? Was rural Virginia full of unemployed laborers for hire? It's a really good question. <laughs> and the answer is very, very few. And it was a real conundrum for Washington. And um, a number of people who um, endorsed um, emancipation and even emancipated their own enslaved um, laborers um, then hired them back as laborers or established them as tenants, somebody like Robert Carter, not my home, who um, um, is responsible for the largest single manumission before the Civil War. He either hires most of them or established them as tenants. And part of it, it wasn't just trying to find why they could for the free um, enslaved people, but also because there's so few um, uh, landless um, laborers to hire. And, Washington's always talking about the fact that hired um, laborers are extremely expensive in, in Virginia. He's hoping that um, if he can rent the farms to British um, tenants and British farmers, that they would bring laborers with them, bring an association of laborers, because um, there, there just aren't that many hired um, white laborers available and they have very high demands for small. Thank you. Um, well, Ruth, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, thank you for your questions. And a reminder that um, Ruth is going to be signing some copies of the book, so do just send an email to info at benjaminfrankenhouse.org if you are interested in receiving one. Thanks so much, everyone, and hope to see you at an event again soon. <laughs>
Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.